Welcome to the Reader House Author Roundtable, where authors from all walks of life come together to discuss the trials, tribulations, and triumphs of publishing their books. I'm Alice Stockton Rossini. Join us here every Saturday night at 8 o'clock or listen to our podcast anytime on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, and PodServe, just to name a few. The Author Roundtable is sponsored by Reader House Online Bookstore, where independent new authors come first. A disabled vet and minister, B.W. Holmes, was outraged when he read a story about a Houston church that refused to bury a woman in her 90s who was a member for 50 years because she hadn't paid her tithes. He was so angry, he wrote a book entitled Salvation for Sale, The Tithing Factor. I mean, I can't even conceive how a church could do something like that. Yes, ma'am, and I I found that uh, horrible that they would do the family uh, that way during the time of, of mourning. But she wasn't allowed to have her funeral there because this minister was more interested in money than he was in saving souls and and respecting uh, those that had passed on. Uh, He wouldn't let him have services there because she was behind on her tithes, he said. And I wanted to raise awareness of the true meaning of tithing and salvation and that you can't uh, sell salvation. Salvation is not for sale. It's it's free to all those that, that want it. According to the scriptures and what God was trying to tell his people, the purpose of tithing was, was meant for. Originally, it was meant for the the Levites uh, didn't receive uh, an inheritance uh, because they were a part of the, I guess you could call the maintenance crew that kept the upkeep of the, the tent of a meeting where they met to worship the Lord. So it was instructed uh, by God to his people to give a tenth of their earnings, which back then was in the form of produce, uh, livestock, and and things of that nature. If you didn't pay your tithing, then the Lord said that you were robbing him and that you would be cursed with a curse. But it's it's taken on a whole new facet now in in today's modern uh, times in the 21st century because pastors are preaching prosperity gospel which is completely against uh, God's law. And and they're encouraging people to to give them money in order to obtain salvation and in order to save their souls, which is is totally false. Most churches today, a disproportionate amount of churches today are are practicing this uh, theology of uh, prosperity. Why would you stay with a church like that? I don't affiliate with uh, any churches here in in Houston anymore because I had the misfortune of being under the leadership of one guy from, uh, he was a Nigerian national, and he was over here, and he was really ripping people off. I mean, he was taking money left and right. And this other guy was speaking of God as if God was some type of pimp on the street and the The parishioners were like uh, his, uh, you know, whores in the street. He would get up every Sunday and say, God said, where is my money? And I found that very disturbing. I can't imagine anybody going to a church like that, except we have the televangelists, right? So remember in the 90s, we had Jim Baker. And I mean, we've always had televangelists, these guys that get on TV and it's, you know, all about the money and people watch the shows and they have these mega churches and I don't get it. I mean, I really personally don't get it, but clearly, clearly people are convinced that this is their way to heaven. I think it was the Catholic church that was, you know, I don't know if you're familiar with Martin Luther, but he was a monk and he's, yes, he's yes, I am. yeah, he split with, he split with the Catholic church for that very reason and started the Lutheran church. Uh, as a matter of fact, it was because of Martin Luther that uh, Michael King, which is his real name, his name wasn't Martin Luther. He wasn't born Martin Luther King. His father took a a, a sabbatical over to Europe in the, the early 60s with a group of ministers, and he was so fascinated with Martin Luther's story that he came back to America, changed his name and his son's name. So Martin Luther had a, 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 a effect on a lot of people. And I agree with his teachings and his philosophy. And I can remember as a teenager, before I entered the military, that Oral Roberts locked himself in a tower. I'm sure you're familiar with this story. 
and said he wasn't coming down until the Lord gave him a million dollars or something like that. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah. And now they're asking for private jets. And, and why can't I ride in a private jet? And, and this one guy from my hometown in Fort Worth, Texas, spending money lavishly and, you know, ostentatious displays of wealth on TV. And it's just, it's getting way out of hand. And I just want to raise awareness so people will know and to read the Bible for themselves. When the Bible says to bring all the tithes into the storehouse so that there may be meat in mine house, the storehouse is not the pastor's house. If the pastor needs support, then the pastor needs to get out and get a job and work for a living. You don't take tithe money and, and use it for your own personal use. That's You don't do that. That's, that's not a, a sound doctrine. And you are robbing God. The Lord says, if you do this, then you're robbing me. He says, will a man rob God? And yes, they will. These preachers are robbing God every day and selling false dreams, pie in the sky uh, dreams to these people that if you give me your money, then God will bless you uh, financially. And that's just an outright lie. Well, it also shows how desperate people are for a, a quick and easy solution. So if I give my money to this guy, I'm going to get something in return. I'm like, I don't get it. I mean, who really goes out and buys a, a 14 karat gold uh, toilet? I mean, really? Yeah. I, you know, and, and you're a minister. You know, really, even if a minister does have self-made wealth, you still, it, it's its not proper to display your wealth in, in the presence of the members. Right. When you have members in your congregation that are struggling from month to month, senior citizens, disabled people, and, and, and single mothers, you know, that are struggling from month to month, week to week, just to survive, you know, right. it's, it's not right. And I'm very upset about it. I was absolutely livid when I read that story about that 94-year-old lady, and she was a lifelong member of that church, had been there since childhood. And now they even require that you show your W-2 when you become a member of a church. That's how bad it, it has gotten now. In several churches here in the U.S., they want to see your tax return when you, you become a new member. And I'm not the kind, I've been a lot of things in my life, but I've never been fake. I've, I've never been counterfeit. And if God doesn't tell me to organize a church and pastor, then I'm not. But those are my plan to start an outreach ministry and a community church. Well, I think that's a great idea. And thanks so much for the heads up. But I do not know what you do about people who join churches that want to see your tax returns. I think that's absolutely crazy. I can't believe that still goes on. And that preacher you mentioned from Fort Worth? He makes $300 million a year. His name is Kenneth Max Copeland, and he's the highest paid pastor in Texas. Unbelievable. All right, Bruce, thanks so much. Thank you so much for calling. Kanan Osborne is a student at Northern Kentucky University majoring in history with a minor in anthropology, and he has published his first book. It is entitled Tejas Night. Now, that, this is a book you started a few years ago, right? Well, this book in particular, Tejas Night, I started writing it when I was 14 years old. I just had the desire to tell the story, I guess. I've always had the desire to tell the stories that come to me. All right. Who inspires you? Uh, probably a variety of influences. His Dark Material series by Philip Pullman and the works of Ursula K. Le Guin and Harry Turtledove and S.M. Sterling. Probably the Emberverse series that he writes, which is also post-apocalyptic and based in an American setting. Now, at 14, what was your process? I'd say my writing process is a mix of things. I first tend to have, like, sort of glimpses of images, and then I build around that. Often I will start with a world and then build the characters into it to make a story. And then, of course, you go through a process of refining it as time goes on, making a distilled product, if you will. What's the book about? Who, who's your main character? My main character? Uh, I would say the main character would probably be Samuel in the book. Okay. He is a veteran of the knights, who in this book are gunslingers, as it's an old Western setting. And he's sort of a grizzled, cynical, nihilist type. He 
has seen too much of the world. He doesn't really believe in anything anymore, and he doesn't really have anything he's proud of. But then he's thrown into circumstances where he's forced to have a stake in things again. He has an adopted son who he saved from slavery, uh, Yigbo, and he it ends up being thrown into this invasion of Tejas, the main country, by a neighboring state that normally does not engage in that kind of activity. And they notice suspicious patterns when they meet Mariah Thames, who is the daughter of a reformist landowner. And in Tejas, the landowners have all the power, whose family has been killed during this invasion. And they begin to suspect a conspiracy is afoot. And that's really how the plot starts. The intricacy of the plot coming from the mind of a 14-year-old is mind-boggling. Oh, well, uh, you know, I had to correct some things as I got older. There were some things, the basic plot was made when I was 14, but then there were some, you know, logical things that just sounded kind of dumb later on that I had to correct when I was older. But yeah, the the very basic skin and bones is uh, from when I was 14. Is there a message here? A message? Uh, I prefer to let the audience read into a message. I would say there's definitely... One could pick out similarities between the time we live in and how Tejas is portrayed. Tejas is a nation ruled by an oligarchy that essentially holds all the power and is refusing to let the nation move into the future. But then there's a couple different visions about how to deal with this current situation among people. For instance, you have the antagonist who has their own vision of moving into the future by essentially establishing what he would see as a efficient dictatorship. And then you have others who desire some sort of return to democracy and actual rule by the common people and believe that they're able to do so on their own. Explore the ideological conflict for the characters, yes. And you explore a little bit of magic too, right? Uh, well, in the book, magic works by taking energy from one source and putting it to a different cause. So there is a character who is a healer in the book who takes energy from their own, essentially, soul and uses it to heal others, which in turn sort of drains them because there's this equivalent exchange in the magic system in the book. And there's also people who use magic in a you know, negative manner by engaging with dark supernatural forces and such. This sounds like it would be an f- awesome like comic book. Oh, yeah, thank you. Like Marvel superhero kind of thing. Oh, yeah, I'd say so. They're probably more uh, warriors than superheroes. If you define, yeah, if you define superheroes being kind of like having a gimmick and being sort of on your own, whereas these are people who are fighting for a cause as part of a group. Do we tie anything up in this book? Oh, I would say that the book could work as a self-contained unit while still leaving room for sequels. But if you read it, you would be pretty satisfied with the ending. I'd say there's a couple of plot lines running co-currently, but they all are sort of part of one thing, like a tree making branches. But they all end up meeting each other near the end. There's no loose threads going on that don't really lead anywhere. I tried to make sure of that. Are they all able to come of one mind? Well, there's some uh, irredeemable conflicts that can't really be solved by just talking it out, so I'd probably say no. And that's what leaves the opening for future novels? Oh, yeah, certainly. I'm sure people know that you wrote this book. Mm-hmm. Have you gotten feedback? Oh, yes, I had feedback through the process of writing it. Before I sent it to a publisher, I sent it to a couple different friends and family members to look it over and give me suggestions as well as editing. So there's been feedback the whole process. Is that something you would recommend, particularly first-time writers, to send excerpts to people they trust for feedback? I would say be open to feedback and... Don't reject it just because it hurts your ego or maybe because you think you made uh, something perfect. And also, you know, be clear about what type of story you want to write also. So find the middle road between 
telling a totally different story based on people's suggestions and not accepting suggestions at all. Do you have any plans for, for how you're going to market this book? Uh, well, I'm working with advertisers through Fulton Books who have helped me set up uh, various social media accounts to help market the book. And I've tried to be in contact with local news stations as well. And I've been planning to reach out to various podcasts and blogs and such who could help me market it. All right. That's great. I just have to ask you, if you could do anything, what would it be? I would definitely write books. And I've also... You know, I have the ambition to branch out into uh, TV and other formats. I'm currently writing a screenplay as well, which is still in the early stages of production. I hope I'll be able to become an author and probably be a professor on the side as well. Like I know a couple of authors do. Probably of history, since that's my major. And are you, are you able to weave that into your stories? Oh, definitely. I take a, uh, a large view of things in stories because I'm thinking about the characters but I'm also thinking about the world they live in and how they're affecting it something people might call uh, in history a macro historical view but for these you know worlds which I'm having to keep self-creating and sustain amazing well it has been interesting talking to you I will tell you that (laughs) thank you it's been interesting talking to you as well Lindsay Allen is a nurse, but she's really drawn to writing children's books and decided it was time to publish one she'd already written. It is entitled Prince Jojo. So how long ago did you write this? Um, Well, actually, uh, back in high school, I had an assignment for a creative writing class about doing a children's book. And that's kind of where the bare bones of it came from. And then when when, you know, I was kind of kind of thinking about getting something published, I kind of just dusted it off, reworked it a little bit, and put it out there. Um, I'm actually I'm 12 years older than my than my little brother, so I helped out with him a lot. So, kind of loosely based off him as as a young kid. <laughs> Tell me the story. Um, well, basically, it's just about young prince, probably about four or five years old, just kind of rambunctious, not really good about following what his parents say and all of that. So he kind of like gets his toys taken away, gets some privileges taken away and everything like that. And he just kind of kind of learns to to go more with what his parents say and be a little more well behaved. So that's kind of the basic story. I, I would say it's basically just kind of, you know, the compromise between having fun as a kid and also doing what you need to do and listening to your parents. So it's just kind of that balance. Okay. Are There's other characters in the book, right? You got the king and the queen. Mm-hmm. Can you tell me more about the other mm-hmm. characters? Uh, basically, it doesn't, doesn't deal too much with them. Just basically their part in it is saying, you know, what are we going to what are we going to do about um, getting him to behave a little better and stuff? And he also has a dog in the book that's just kind of in the background playing with them and going around with them. So his dog is his best friend. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So you wrote this book how many years ago? Uh, Actually, like kind of the idea started in high school, which would have been about uh, 15 years ago or so. But um, actually the, the publishing process of how it is now I think we started in about, it was probably about October or November. Okay. Does Prince Jojo, is this a a series of books and he's the main character? Yes, I do have have ideas uh, for some other books kind of, you know, involving maybe uh, him going to school, using his imagination, getting a sibling, things like that, that other things we could do with that character. Have you gotten any feedback? Have any have you been able to read this to any little kids? Oh yeah, I got uh, uh some uh friends and family have given it to their kids and they're liking it so far, so that's good. And you enjoyed this process? Oh yeah, it's it's been a it's been a really fun process. It's really kind of cool to see ideas that you have come to life and and I'm not a, uh, not a real good jar or anything so working with them to get the illustrations done and everything was really cool and just a 
kind of see what I had in my head as far as what the illustrations would look like come to be and everything. So that that was a, a really cool process. Yeah, how was it when you finally got it in your hands? Oh, was that that was really cool. It was just like I you kinda understand how artists and stuff like, Oh, but that's my baby. It's like, oh yeah, it's like, you know, something that's kinda been in your head and you've been thinking about is is there and and in person. Right. <laughs> Are you considering reading to children? Oh yeah, I actually think uh that would be a really great idea looking into to how to do that. Maybe go to schools and stuff. Do you have plans to release another book? Yes, I, I have a, you know, kind of a couple ideas going around to, to see kind of how this does and everything and and then maybe do a couple more. Do you have any advice to authors out there that are, they want they want to do it, they want to do it, but they just can't, haven't been able to do it? Um, I would say, well, it's, like, it's kind of like me. One day I just decide, okay, well, let's do it. So you kind of just, have to to make that decision to okay just go ahead and do it and and just see it through until until it happens if it's something you really want all right thank you so much all right thank you we hope you enjoyed this edition of the reader house author roundtable where authors from all walks of life come together to discuss the trials tribulations and triumphs of publishing their books I'm Alice Stockton Rossini. We hope to see you back here every Saturday night at 8 o'clock or listen to our podcast anytime on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, and PodServe, just to name a few. The Author Roundtable is sponsored by Reader House Online Bookstore, where independent new authors come first.